We come to a message about authority, and it's a two-prong message. On one side, we'll see one main prong, and then on the other side, we'll see the other one. Um, but it is with all authority, and while under authority, we look at the instructions of God's Word. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus. This is on your context and background. If you're new to us this morning, we want you to know where we are in this passage. The Apostle Paul has left missionary Titus on the island of what? Crete. Crete. Not concrete, Crete. Uh, I don't know, maybe we get concrete from that, I don't think so. But he's on the island of Crete, which is out in the Mediterranean. And it's this island, that is, this is important for today, that is very cosmopolitan. There's pe- it's kind of like South Florida. There's people on this island from everywhere. Why? Because it's a central transit point in the Mediterranean. They wouldn't sail for long periods of time on a big, beautiful cruise ship like we now see in the Mediterranean. They had little tiny sailboats, and they would sail for a couple of days, and they'd stop halfway there, and then they'd sail for a couple of days to another island, and then they would keep going on perhaps to Rome or to Spain or wherever it was they were going. Well, Crete was strategically placed in the middle of the Mediterranean that it was a real place of commerce. It was a real place where ships would stop over. It was a real place that had influence from everywhere. And in fact, the Cretans didn't have a very good reputation. The Apostle Paul deals with this. We see it in chapter 1 that Cretans are considered liars. Cretans are considered very, very dishonest. Cretans are considered rather treacherous. And so it was a very worldly place. It wasn't too nice. I, I had one of our members of our church that was out for the last two weeks. They were um, up north in a very much more of a laid-back environment. And I saw the text yesterday. Um, and he said, I forgot to prepare myself for coming home to South Florida. Um, how many of you have ever experienced that before? You're off somewhere, and it's kind of quiet and nice and, and whatever. And then you come back to South Florida, and you, you see the... You, you see the, the speed of life, you see the abruptness that we have, um, you see the very eclectic nature of it. Um, I even experienced that this, earlier this summer, we were visiting Nico and Andrea in San Francisco. And San Francisco is a big, busy place, but it's kind of laid back. In fact, it's more laid back than I thought. We flew from San Francisco to L.A., and within moments, we had had a couple of life harrowing experiences on the road and everything else. I mean, L.A. is not San Francisco when it comes to the attitude of the town. Well, that's very much in play here in this passage. There are Christians living on this Cretan island that is a very corrupt place. And in fact... The Christians that are living there are in churches, and those churches are messed up. Those churches haven't had good leaders. Those churches have had actually fraudulent leaders that are very self-absorbed. And so Paul comes in seeking to straighten it out. He leaves Titus there to continue to work on a few things. And we've said over and over again, the churches had problematic, and if you haven't filled these in, fill these in, the churches had problematic leaders, they had problematic doctrine, and they had problematic behavior concerning their own Christian lives. So they weren't, many of the people in the churches weren't truly acting like Christians. And so notice the next line here. The life of church members is to be distinctly Christian while still in the surrounding culture. Christians, even though you may live in a place that is not at all Christians, that doesn't mean that, hey, when you're in, your Ro- when you're in Rome, be like the Romans, you know? I mean, it, we don't just adapt to the culture and take in the culture. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to be distinct as God's people in a godless society. So notice this, the next line that's there. This is a powerful witness for showing Christ to a godless culture when Christians are distinct. When Christians are distinct, this is a powerful witness to showing Christ to a godless culture like Crete or where else? How about South Florida? Hey, this is our Crete. You're the the Christians. We're the Christians. This is our Crete. 
We're, this is where we are called to, to live a different life, both inside the church and outside the church, so that the world can see who Christ is. Now, I want you to notice the passage that we look at today. It's the last verse from chapter 2, and wow, we make it all the way to chapter 3 today in our study. So look at chapter 2, verse 15. Says, this is in the box on the page that's there in front of you. Chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul has just given a bunch of instructions, and he tells Titus, Titus, verse 15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with what? All authority. Would you circle those two words, all authority? Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Wow. Now look at verse 3, I mean verse 1 of chapter 3. It's also the same thing. You remember the chapter divisions came um, many, hundreds and hundreds of years after this was written. The chapter divisions are not inspired by the Holy Spirit like the text is. But there were some Frenchmen and some German guys that got together and over a period of about 100 years, they, they went through and they said, let's make the Bible where we can find passages very easily. So they added chapters, and then later they came back and they added verses, and those largely stuck, and they're largely very good and very helpful. But here is an example where it's kind of hard to separate these two these two verses in different chapters because they're very similar and they segue from one area of Titus in, over into another area. But listen to this. The word authority is very, very important for both of these sections, both of these statements. So the first one in 2.15, declare these things in chapter 3, verse 1. He's saying, remind them to be submissive. Can you underline the word submissive? This is similar to authoritative. It has to do with that. To rulers and who? Authorities. So there you see it. To be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now, teachers, wouldn't it be great if everybody over in these buildings did this this year, would you like that? Wouldn't that be wonderful if you never had to say anything to them? They just did this. You would think, well, that would be like teaching school in heaven. Yeah. Well, let's go for that. Moms and dads, we want to we help them see that this is, these are Christianly ideas, that these are, these are godly ideas, and uh, th we, we want to see where this type of attitude comes from in some of the reasons that God calls his people to live by these things. So we, we want to see this. Notice this. First and foremost, we want to see chapter 2 and verse 15, the first one that we looked at, is God's authority is our highest authority. God's authority is our highest authority. Now, we live in a day and time when the word authority seems to be almost a dirty word. For the last 50 or 60 years in our nation, um, since World War II, um, there, have been a, there's, there has been a progressive cultural march for numerous, numerous reasons, march away from a positive image of authority. Um, from the Watergate scandals, um, to various other things through the 70s and various, various scandals, both political and cultural. And then we come into a highly polarized political environment where, where we have a great amount of, of really corruption and a great amount of distortion of our values. And in fact, leaving our values, you couple the, the political, it's not just political, but you couple the political aspect with it with the philosophical aspects of, of postmodernism and many of the things that have been happening for the last 80 or 90 years in education, not just, lower, not just younger education, but high elite education, all of these things have been marching away from an adherence to any type of authority. You see, the human heart wants to be its own authority. And the less we have of God's word and the more we have of the world's thinking, we walk away 
from submission of ourselves to an authority over us. And that, this is a very dangerous thing for a culture. No, it, whenever, whenever there is authority understood in the life of a culture, it is better than an authority, a society with no authority. A society with no authority, which, which would be complete and total libertarianism, it, it, is a society that comes undone. And so there's this there's these God-given, Romans 13 tells us that the authorities that are on the earth, ever how corrupt they may be, ever how sinful they may be, God has given authorities to the earth. That has to do with political authorities, but how about this? There's also the authorities of family structure. There's also the authority of work environment. There's also the authority within the life of a church for Christians. But what we want to see here is our ultimate authority for Christians is that we look to God in what he says is true. And we see this in chapter 2 and verse 15. He's saying all of these instructions that have just been given, they need to be adhered to with great, great carefulness. Look at this statement that's underneath this statement, that's underneath God's authority. Paul is reminding Titus that the instructions that were just given to, you remember, older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves. You can go back and read that if you weren't here for those. Verses 1 through 10. These instructions are from who? These are from God. They're not merely from the Apostle Paul, but they are from God. We see this pattern throughout the New Testament that God is working and, and God is, is showing in the New Testament life of the church, the fulfillment of his promises, the fulfillment of his plan, and he is giving his word of truth to his people. And so they are from God, and they are under his authority. And that's exactly what Paul is telling Titus. Paul is telling Titus, you teach these things with confidence. You hold people to these truths. You see, it's important for us to recognize that Paul gets his authority not from himself, but he gets his authority from Christ. Notice this next statement that is here. Jesus' teaching was immediately recognized when he began teaching as having, fill it in, real authority. In fact, if you remember with me, back in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. And there, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to see what the people say. And look at verse 28. This is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, and it's either on the screen or on your outline. Look what it says in verse 28. And when Jesus finished these things, saying these things, these sayings, the crowds were, circle the word, astonished. I mean, that is a very colorful word. That is a very powerful word. I mean, they're shocked. This, it, really, the idea is they're speechless. They, they hardly know what to say. They've just heard this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus challenges everything that they see in their religious establishment, and he shows them what God is really after. And they're, they're shocked. Look at the next part that is there. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So they had all of these religious leaders who didn't really believe what they were teaching. They would open up and all of the, all of the tr reality was there was a Jewish religious establishment that sure, they had the Torah. But they had found all kinds of ways to distort the Torah, and they simply lorded over the people, and the people knew it. The people knew they were frauds. But when Jesus stood up, somebody that they had never heard from, that didn't go the, to the University of Jerusalem, and, and I mean, he, he, was, he was from out of the blue, when he stands up and he starts declaring to them what God is really interested in, they're shocked, and they could tell Something is very, very different. This is from the beginning of, of Matthew's gospel. Look at the next statement that is here. So not only do they recognize his real authority, but look at the next one. Jesus' teaching and actions were always rooted in the authority of Old Testament scriptures. Jesus didn't show up with a different message. 
Jesus showed up standing on the truth of God from the Old Testament scriptures. And notice these, there's a few bullet points that are here. He constantly confronted distortions of God's word. Did you hear what I just said just a moment ago? That they kept distorting it, they kept changing it, they kept altering it. You know, the idea was, honor your mother and father, um, and if you do this, your life is going to be blessed, you'll, you'll live long on the earth. Take care of them. Well, let me tell you that the, the Old Testament work that they had, that the word that had told them to do that, they said, okay, I will do that, but here's the deal. If I have all of my wealth that I've worked real hard for and my parents are older and I dedicate all of my wealth to God for ministry, then if my mother and my father come to me and ask for money in their time of need, I can say, sorry, mom and dad, I've already dedicated all this to God. I mean, go read it for yourself, Matthew 15. That's what they were saying. That's what they were doing. And they were saying, Jesus, Jesus is saying, you're ignoring what God told you to do in honoring your mother and your father and caring for them. And so there were, there were all kinds of little things that they would, they would even use Scripture against Scripture to distort what God had said. And so we not only see that they would distort it, but they would just flat disobey it. Look at the next part here. He constantly rebuked disobedience of God's word. So not only distortion of it, but just flat out disobedience of God's word. We see this over and over and over again in his teaching. Look at the next bullet point. At first, Jesus refused to tell the source of his authority. In fact, the chief priests and the elders came and they said to him, by what authority do you do these miracles, and by what authority do you say the things that you say? And Jesus looked at them, and knowing that the time was not yet ready for them to say, look, you don't realize it yet, but I'm God. They're not ready to hear that yet as a crowd, and so he would simply answer a question with a question. And he said, well, tell me, was John the Baptist baptism from God? Is his teaching from God? Or is it from himself? Well, he, they knew the crowds believe that John the Baptist is a prophet. And if we say that he is not from God, that they're going to rebel against us. But if we say that he's from God, then we're authorizing all of this new teaching that we don't like. And so Jesus said, you tell me and I'll tell you. And they refuse to answer. So Jesus at first is letting, listen, he's letting them see and hear his teaching and his power before he calls out and explains to them where it all comes from. They're starting to see, they're starting to hear. Look at the next part here. At the right time, Jesus explained that God the Father is the source of his authority. So Jesus comes in perfect submission to the Father. The equal with the Father, the, the perfect unity within the Trinity is there. The second person of the Trinity leaves the halls of heavens at the command of the Father, and he comes to the earth to purchase God's people from their sin, sin and from death in order to save them. So he comes on this great mission, but he does it at the perfect submission to the Father as he does that. When he does that, he comes to show us God's love and God's grace, and he comes to base all of the authority that he would give in submission to the Father. Look at John chapter 7 and verse 16. So Jesus answered them, underline this, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Look at verse 18. The one who speaks on his own authority does what? Seeks his own glory. So this is a big, huge problem, not only back then, but even today. You see, if I preach under my own authority, and this is where this is going, if I preach under my authority and, and seek to manipulate or seek to cause a, a following to me, I am seeking the glory of what really belongs to God. 
And so we see that that is the same problem that was going on in that very place. And so Jesus comes and he shows us a totally different way. And listen to this, he shows us the humility and the grace of God that even though he comes from heaven and even though he's the second person of the Trinity, he has submitted himself to the obedience of the Father within the Trinity and in this beautiful picture of the Father submitting to the Son and the Son exalting the Father and this God, Father exalting in the, 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 the Son and the Spirit, there is this beautiful interaction within the Trinity of each one of them bringing glory to the other. This is, this is beautiful, flawless, seamless, listen, true relationship. We see in the nature of God true relationship, perfect relationship without rival. We see perfect relationship in total submission to one another. It is a beautiful picture of this selflessness that we see in God's perfect being. So if you're wondering, what, you know, what is all this stuff about Father, Son, and Spirit? How does all this work? How is he one God but in three persons? This is part of the great mystery that we've just sung about. The mystery of how God, not only in his, in his own being, in his own existence, shows his love and his grace and his goodness, but also in his actions here on this earth that we begin to see the mystery of a God who comes to save us from our sins. So look at that passage again in verse 18. It says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. And so there's this beautiful picture that Jesus finds all of his authority and has all of his authority in the Father. Now look at John chapter 8, verse 28. And this is where Jesus comes, and he says, this is where my authority is, and this is who I am. Look what he says in verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, right there, crucified, because to lift up is referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Circle the word he. This is referring to Messiah. I am the sacrifice. I am the Messiah who's going to pay for God's people. Look what he says, that I am he. And that I do nothing on my what? Wow. So there's not a rivalry in heaven going on. Jesus is voluntarily submitting to the Father. And the Father is beautifully giving himself, giving his son for our sins. So he says that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Verse 29, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. You see, it's this perfect relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. Verse 30, as he was saying these things, many what? because they start to see he is Messiah. Now, we also see that many, many believed, and fill this in, after Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, it was after his death and resurrection did things start to come together for them. The light started to go on. They started to see the big picture in all of this. And they began to, it be, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ in their minds and in their understanding comes to bring legitimacy to his ultimate authority. Now, here's an important concept for us. If God the Son depended on God the Father for the message, how much more do we as humans and do we as leaders in the life of the church, how much more do we need to depend upon God's word for our authority and our truth? Do you see where I'm going? Do you see, what, do you see the point here? If Jesus had to depend upon the Father for his authority, how much more does Paul and Titus and Lucas, not Luke, 
the gospel writer, but Lucas Almeida, and Ben Nistor, and Andrew Coleman, and Charles Stanley, and John MacArthur, and John Piper, and anybody and everybody else who ever teaches the Word of God, how much more do we need to depend upon God in His truth? You see, it is not the ideas of men. It's not the clever philosophies of men or the clever creativity that you need to hear. It's not the sociology and the psychology and the positive thinking and, and all of the other issues that are going to make your life better. Where, where the true authority and message is is when it's based in God's Word. And so if Jesus submitted himself to the authority of the, of the Father who sent him, how much more are we? So look at the page, look at the box at the top of the page once again before we turn it over. Look at what it says there. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with what? All authority. Let no one disregard you. See, the reason that the Apostle Paul could tell, Tim, or tell Titus to do that is because it was authoritative from God. Look at the next sheet, or flip it over, and um, notice with me here. You see, this is the pastor's responsibility to God and to his people. Anytime a pastor stands to teach the Bible, there's, an, there's a, a saying that some of us often think about as we're preparing and as we're standing here, Lord, I want to preach for an audience of one. I want to preach for the audience of you. I want to be faithful to what you have said. Because if I am faithful to what you have said, then your people are going to hear what you have said. And so it should be the goal every time that I stand to preach or anyone stands in this pulpit or in any other pulpit to very, very carefully say, thus says the Lord. And if, if you hear what God says through his word accurately and carefully without manipulation and without coloring, without taint and without all of those things, then your soul is fed not by me but by God's word. And God's word is the eternal word. My ideas will come and go. God's word and his truths are forever. And so that's what you need. And this is part of the reason, by the way, that people often will say this. They come, and if you were to ask any of us in a room after a day like today, after a message like this, well, what part spoke to you the most? What spoke to this guy over here might be very different than what spoke to the person sitting right next to him. The Holy Spirit uses his word in our lives for what our heart and our mind and our circumstance need for today. And he does that by the power of his Holy Spirit. He's the only one that does that. Now, occasionally somebody will come up to me and say, well, pastor, when you said this, it really spoke to me. And I'm sitting there going, I didn't say that. Um, so I know sometimes we, 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 we didn't quite hear or... God is speaking through his word in a way that as you study and as you look and as you look at the passages, I didn't even have to say it because he is working through that way um, as we come to submit ourselves to the grace of his teaching. So notice this with me, the pastor's responsibility to God and his people. We see these right out of the text. These are the things that are there, four things. Number one, to speak the truth of God, to speak the truth of God, declare these things. Um, right out there to the side, uh, 1 Peter 4.11. So 1 Peter 4.11 says, to the one who speaks, he is to speak the very oracles of God. That means he is to speak the very words of God. Here's the point. Don't change the message. Amen. Don't water it down. Don't make it harsher. Just, just be very careful to say what God says. Be very careful to be accurate. Don't change it. Look at the next part here. To plead the truth of God. This is what we see when it uses the word exhort. The word exhort means to plead. It means to beg. It means to persuade. So it's not merely saying, hey, here it is, take it or leave it. That should never be the attitude of a pastor when he's preaching the word. Here it is, take it or leave it. What should be the attitude of the pastor preaching the word should be, hey, here's the word of God, please believe it. 
And let me show you why this is true. Let me try to convince you. Let me, let me exhort you. Let me beg you to turn away from looking at the wisdom of the world and look to the wisdom of God. It, that should be our attitude as a church. That as we come to church, that we're saying, oh Lord, speak to us. Oh Lord, come and move in us. And as we look at one another as church people, as, as church members in the life of the church, that we should have the attitude that we are pleading with one another to stay close to the Lord, to stay very much in his word, and to believe his word. And so to, to exhort means to plead the truth of God. Look at the next one that is there in the verse. It is to rebuke or to correct through the truth of God. This is what pastors are, are called to do in the box at the top of the page. Look, at it, look what it says. Rebuke with all what? Authority. You see, it's not Andrew Coleman that is rebuking someone. If Andrew Coleman is rebuking someone, the only reason that I should do that, the only reason I should correct someone is through the word of God, not based upon my preferences but based upon what his word says. And there's been many times when I've gone to people and I've said, hey brother or hey sister, your life is, is, is being lived here on this issue in contrast to what God's word says. And I want to encourage you, I want to help you to come and, and obey what God says here, not just do what everybody else is doing out in the world. There have been other times when when we've gone and we've, we've shared with somebody, hey, brother, you're, you're, you're going down this path and this is dangerous. This is dangerous for you. This is dangerous for your family. Let us help you. And there's been times when guys just look at me and go, I am so glad you called me. I am so glad you said these things to me. I was headed the wrong way. I was listening to the wrong voices. I was going the wrong way. I got my mind just over here in this other thing and it was wrong and I'm... You, you have saved me from going down a path that was going to hurt me. You see, there's, there's been times when people have come to me and said, Andrew, why are you doing this? You, 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 you're on dangerous ground. You need to do this instead. I remember as a young man, as a 20-year-old, that um, by a letter, a man rebuked me. He lived in Europe. I'd gone and served in Europe. And I, and I did something that wasn't good. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like immoral, but it was just unwise and and I had, I had done something that wasn't part of the plan, and he found out about it, and he wrote a letter to me. And I opened it in our old office as a 19-year-old or as a 20-year-old in our old office. I remember seeing the letter from Al Meredith was his name, and I get it, and I'm looking at it, and I read it, and then as I'm reading it, I realize, wow, he was really upset about something we did that summer. And I realized that what we'd done was wrong. We went to a city that we weren't supposed to do. We went off the beaten path. We went in a situation that if something had gone wrong, they wouldn't have known where to look for us. They wouldn't have known. And when he found out about it, he let me have it. And he rebuked me. You know, I, I couldn't get to a phone fast enough to call him and say, I am so sorry. You're right. I, I did the wrong thing. You see, our spiritual leadership in our lives is there to help protect us and help us. A rebuking, that is not a bad word. It can be a very good word, just like repentance. We've talked recently with our teachers that repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is a great word. We want our children to constantly repent. We want this, our students to repent. We want in our own lives to show constant repentance of coming back to God over and over and over again. The last bullet point that is here that a pastor must do is to steadfastly demand compliance. To steadfastly demand compliance. So your little mealy-mouthed preacher that's not supposed to have much of an opinion and supposed to be only called, you know, speaking when called upon, that's not quite the picture of the New Testament. That became very popular about 150 years ago in England, you know, that the pastor's a wallflower. Or even here in the United States, pastor is just a perfunctory ceremonial position that just kind of comes and blesses everyone. And, you know, he's supposed to be rather innocuous, not very much influence in your life. That is not at all what we see in the scriptures. In the scriptures, what we see is hopefully the pastors that are in a church are helping guide and care for the flock. And as we, as, we, as we often do, as we start to stray, as sheep start to stray, the pastors, pastor means shepherd, 
go and they say, hey, it's over here, it's over here, come back over here. Stay, stay with the group, don't get separated. Wolf will come get you. You'll go off the cliff, you'll get lost, you'll be hungry, you won't have anything to drink. Stay, stay with the crowd. That's part of what, now, there are, the reason that the Apostle Paul, look at the box at the top of page 215, it says, let no one disregard you. The reason that he had to say that is because sometimes when you're pastoring people in a church, there are some people that say, don't tell me. I only want to hear what you have to say. I'm going to do my own thing. And the Apostle Paul is telling Titus, Titus, there's going to be some people that seek to disregard you, and he's saying, don't let them get away with it. He's saying, you be careful to help everybody stay in the right vein. Because as soon as that starts to happen, you're going to see a dysfunction and you're going to see division come in that's harmful. Now, uh, you know, somebody could preach this and if they're all about their own glory and their own ideas and their own thoughts, then, you know, this is nice authoritative stuff for them to have power to manipulate. But that's not at all the picture that we see through the New Testament of a true pastor. A true pastor is simply seeking to point people to God over and over and over again and help them live in accordance with his word. So we see the next part, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And here's where we want our kids to, to walk with Christ, and we have to show them how to do that. And this is how the world comes to Christ. The congregation's responsibility to God and others in a pagan society. That's what this is. This is what all of us are to do. So the first part was the pastor's responsibility to God, but here's the congregation's responsibility, and that is exactly what is being said in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Look at the box at the top of the page. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people well, why would he say these things? It's important for us to recognize, and you can fill these in that are underneath here, that the focus shifts from how to live in the church, that's what was in chapter 2, to how to live in the surrounding community. So chapter 2 is kind of showing us how Sheridan Hills ought to relate to each other. Now we're seeing how Sheridan Hills ought to relate out in Hollywood Hills, how it ought to relate in Miramar, how it ought to relate in Miami and Plantation and Sunrise. Everywhere we live, this is how we're supposed to live, at work, at school, at home, wherever it is that we're come from. Look at this and notice this with me. Number one, there's six statements here that are important that lead up to us understanding what it says. Number one, cultural Christianity in America as cultural Christianity in America crashes, you can fill that in, and that's what's happening, we have a growing similarity to the culture of Crete. More and more and more, the America that we live in today is reflecting more the Cretan culture than it is reflecting a biblical culture. And I know that some of you don't want to hear that. I know that some of you, this is, and, and, and I'm one of these, that is a very painful thought to me. I like to think of America as a, as a pretty biblical society. I like to think of it as pretty Christian. And there are some places that you can still go where there's kind of this culture of Christianity still there. I think we all know that South Florida is not one of those places, right? We live kind of on the edge. This is kind of like Southern California. This is kind of like Northern California. This is kind of like um, you know, various areas of New York, the Northeast, or whatever. And many of you come from places that were never very Christian. Some of you come from places that were very, very Christian, even in the Caribbean or some of the other places. But, but you look at it and you go, well, wait a minute. There, there's many of us that come from areas that were never very much like that. But now, for sure, America is less and less propped up by cultural Christianity. And it, we are starting to reflect the culture of Crete more and more. Look at the first bullet point. We now live in a post-Christian society. We used to be somewhat of a Christian society, and now we don't live in that. Instead, we are dominated and guided in, as a society by pagan values, not biblical values. And we want to look and see what some of those things are. Look at the next bullet point. Though our society was built on biblical beliefs and standards 
for the most part. Today, and here's what some of them are, self-expression, moral freedom, don't tell me what to do, I can do whatever I want. How about this one, materialism. How about this word, hedonism? Hedonism, what is hedonism? Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure. So if you kind of look at some of these, this, this demand to be self-expressive, moral freedom, materialism, hedonism, all of these are the prevailing gods of the American culture now. Now, there are Christians within this culture that would say, those are not my gods. But I can tell you that the culture as a whole, that, that is a reality that we must come to recognize. That's where we are. Look at the next bullet point there. Here's part of the real problem. Biblical literacy, that means knowing the Bible, the value of family, protection and training of who? Children. The value of personal responsibility, taking responsibility for yourself, personal integrity, and civic duty have almost disappeared from as a priority in our society. And we could give statistic after statistic after statistic of how we've left the Bible. We have, we have, no, longer to continue, we have no longer continued to value family. We've let the family be um, torn apart over and over and over again by, our, by everything else that threatens against it. We're not protecting children and training children like we used to. And the value of personal responsibility and personal integrity and civic duty those things are simply fleeting away as we become um, worshiping the gods that are in the bullet point that's above that. So, point number two is this. As biblical Christians, we are called to love and to show pagans Christ by sharing and living the gospel. The, the, the reality is, this is what we're in, we are called to love pagans to Christ. We cannot assume that people around us understand the Bible. We cannot assume that they share our values as Christians. And so while we do not assume that anymore, we are called to still speak the gospel to them and show them Christ. And that's what these verses are about. These verses are about how do Christians live out in the world? How do they show the world who Jesus is? Now, number three is important for us. We must not fall into hating them, demonizing them, and fighting them. Because if we, if we fall into hating them, demonizing them, and fighting them, we're fighting the very people, and we're hating the very people that we're supposed to love. This doesn't make sense. What if Jesus looked at the world when he showed up and said, you guys obviously don't get the law, you obviously don't have any justice, and you obviously don't care about people the way God has told you for 3,000 years to care for people, and so good riddance, I'm done with you. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus came and he walked with us. Jesus came and he was patient with us. Jesus came and he taught us the truth. And he did so powerfully. And it's, and it's not just that he came to the people that seemed to be pretty righteous and pretty close to the mark. Jesus came and who did he hang out with? Let's name a few. Tax collectors. That means immoral people that were ripping people off. Who else? Prostitutes, thank you, whores. I mean, he, he is hanging out with those who are very immoral. He's hanging out with people that are uneducated as well. I mean, he, he's, he's down with the people that are fishermen that can't get along with everybody in town, so they very often would go and become fishermen. I mean, he's, he's spending time with even religious leaders like Nicodemus that the people very often hated. He would go and he would spend time with a Roman centurion who was, I'm sure, disliked by the mere fact that he's a Roman ruling over the people of Israel. And so Jesus went, and instead of hating them, 
And instead of constantly rejecting them, Jesus went and he taught them and he loved them. Number four, angry Christians have never won anyone to faith in Jesus. Angry Christians do not win people to Jesus Christ. When we see the conflict of culture in the news, when we see the conflict of those things, I'm not saying, oh, we just accept the culture. I'm not saying we go become one of them. If you can't, if you can't beat them, what is the phrase? If you can't, if you can't win, you, you join them. It, no, 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 no. Christians are not to have that attitude. But in the same regard, Titus is telling us, you're not going to change the culture by being an angry Christian that just runs around condemning um, everyone all the time. We're called to be much more thinking Christians that are loving in Jesus' name while speaking the truth of the gospel. See, number five says this, faithfully loving God and genuinely loving people is how Christianity wins societies. This is how Christianity wins, is when we love God, when we love God supremely, when we love God above everything else. That is so important. In fact, right below loving God, 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, we see that God has called us to love him and his kingdom more than we love this earthly kingdom. Faithfully loving God and genuinely loving people is how Christianity is. Now, I put out some words that are out to the side here. In Rome, by the way, this is how so much of, Rome, of the Roman society became Christians. They were under persecution. They weren't embracing that, but they also were not revolting, burning down the place. In fact, Nero blamed the great fire of Rome on Christians because he, he wanted to have a, a scapegoat. But it wasn't true. Christians were simply loving people around them. And that is how the Roman culture wound up over the next 400 years, had so many people that became Christians. They were not staging a rebellion and a revolt. They were loving people and loving God. Um, we also see it in China. That's what happened over the last 150 years in China. Millions upon millions of Chinese have come to faith in Jesus, not through revolt, and not through stark and harsh condemnation, but through Christians loving God, loving each other, and loving the people that are around them. In India, ever since William Carey and ever since Adonai Judson went through India, we have seen hundreds of thousands, millions of Indi people from India, Indians, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And today, there are great Indian cultures there that are Christian cultures because of Christians loving God and loving the people around them, but not rejecting the culture that is there and condemning everybody that is within it. Titus number, number six says, Titus chapter three, verses one through two, here is the great strategy, and get this, the great strategy of transformed lives transform cultures. This is how we transform the culture, is that our lives are transformed. And as our lives are transformed, one life at a time, this is how a culture gets transformed. It's not through all of the political power. It's not through forcing other people to try to act like Christians. It's coming and seeing their lives change. And we see this in the passage. Letter A, be submissive to rulers and authorities. Now, Jesus made clear, earthly kingdoms are not our focus. Earthly kingdoms are not our focus. They came to him and they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? They were trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus said, hand me a coin. He looked at the coin. He said, whose face is on the coin? They said Caesar. They hated that. They hated the fact that his, number one, his image was on the coin. That's a graven image. But number two, they hated the fact that they had to give a pagan, harsh Caesar over them, a ruler over them, their money. And Jesus said, you know what? Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. And so Jesus said, yes, pay your taxes. Jesus didn't say, go rebel against this injustice that is so horrible. He said, pay your taxes and love God. Look at the next part, letter B. Be obedient. Christians are to obey, <laughs> key word, except against the commands of God. 
And we see that in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, Peter is told, you are no longer to preach in the name of Jesus. And, Jesus, and Peter just looked at him and said, sorry, buddy, I'm going to keep preaching in the name of Jesus. This is the only name to preach in. This, yeah, I, I, cannot, I cannot comply with your request because this is against the truth of God. Um, and there's many different areas of our life where, where we may not be able to comply with the government, especially in the, de- years, in the days to come. Um, that's going to happen more and more. Right now, there's a lot of persecution going on in China. I mean, like this week, things have been changing in China. Um, churches are being closed. People are being told to give in their Bibles, hand in their Bibles. Um, Bible sales are now prohibited. And um, na- now, all of a sudden... There's this thing of, well, we want to obey the government, but when the ob- government is telling us to do things that is against the commands of God, we're not going to obey the government because God is the higher authority. And so we, we have to do that very carefully. You don't use that as an excuse to rebel. There's some who do that. A, that. That is a distortion. We're not to do that, but we are called to be obedient um, except for when it conflicts with God's commands. Look at the next part, letter C. The scripture says, be ready for every good work. What does that mean? It means, fill it in, serve others quickly and gladly. Galatians 6, it says, take every opportunity, quickly seize the opportunity to serve others. You see, this is showing the world the spirit of Christ. Letter D, speak evil of no one. Now, this is really important, and here's part of the reason. It simply goes nowhere. Think about it with me. The people that you really respect they rarely are the people who are going around ripping on everybody else. When we don't speak evil of others that are around us, we are being a citizen that brings harmony and we're being a citizen that brings unity. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't, I mean, when it comes to a political situation, we don't say, well, this guy does stand against the things that I disagree with. It's fine to talk about that. But when you in your neighborhood sit there and talk about your other neighbors in front of your other neighbors and you're, you're ripping on the neighbors that are around you, they go, well, why would I listen to what he has to say? He probably does the same thing when he's not with me, about me. You see, when we speak evil of others, it makes you look bad. You can put that off to the side. It makes you look bad. It's a bad testimony of Christ. How about letter E? Avoid quarreling. And we often hear it said, meet fire with fire. No, meet fire with water. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. There are six things the Lord hates, yea, seven. Do you know what the last one is that is mentioned there? He who spreads strife among brothers. You see, quarreling doesn't get us where we need to go. In fact, um, Proverbs 15 and verse 1 talks about the idea of gentleness and the fact that we are to be gentle and turn away from wrath. Look at letter F. Be gentle. This is usually the opposite of the norm in your natural response. When you are wronged, you usually don't feel like being gentle. But we need to think in terms of self-control. Self-control is what children need to learn from a very young age. They cannot learn it from adults who are out of control. Part of our great problem, even in the Christian community, is that there's a lot of adults that don't have very much self-control. And so it's kind of difficult to teach our children to have self-control when we ourselves do not exhibit that on a regular basis to our children. And so I want to just say to you, Christians, look and listen to this passage from Titus. I mean, we are called to be submissive to those around us, not not think we're king. We're called to be obedient. We're called to be serving others, ready for every good work, not speaking evil of everyone. Otherwise, our, our children just learn the very same thing. Avoid quarreling, be gentle, and look at the last one, and you need to change that to G. I do know my alphabet. I just messed it up here. That's G, not E. Um, Show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now, the word courtesy here is used over and over to describe the way in which Jesus fulfilled his mission. It's, It's this beautiful picture of humility. Courtesy 
is something that our world is losing fast. In fact, we know from Matthew chapter 24 and we know from numerous other places in, in the prophecies about what is going to happen in the future is that the heart of men and women will grow cold. And when our hearts grow cold, we're no longer courteous. And this, this is something that South Floridians have to work on. We come from other places where we don't know common graces toward each other. Wow, that even rhymes. Um, but we, we come from all of these other places, and what we, we need to start to realize that from the expressions on our face to what we do and how we drive and how we think, that we come more and more into a courteous spirit because this is good for our witness. Notice here with me Jesus in Matthew chapter 21 Verse 5, he came into Jerusalem on a what? A donkey. He came in humility. That's what we see. In Matthew chapter 11, he says this, take my yoke upon you and come and learn of me. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then he says this, for I am gentle and I'm lowly in spirit. Do, are we gentle are we lowly in spirit? The King of kings, Lord of lords, who leaves the halls of heaven, he comes to lay down on a cross. And he comes into Jerusalem in humility. Do, do we act like him? Look at the next part here. And the way, this is not only the way Jesus fulfilled his mission, but this is also the way that we are to fulfill our mission. It's interesting that 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this. It says, be ready in season and out of season to make a defense and to be able to explain the reason for the hope that is within you. But listen, and then it goes on and it says, be ready to do that, but with gentleness. But with gentleness. You see, very often, the Christian command to preach the gospel has been turned into an abrasive, harsh thing. And we as Christians would do well to say, oh no, we can be very solid, we can be very secure, we can be very steadfast in what we believe. We just need to be gentle. We need to be loving. We need to be careful as we do this. You see, angry Christians aren't gonna win anybody to Jesus, but loving Christians will reach many, many people for Jesus. Amen? Amen? Now, here's my question to you. Two questions. Are these, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are these you? I'd like to ask you to look at those for a moment. Look at letter A. Look at B. C. U. D. E, do you quarrel? Letter F, are you gentle? G, do you show courtesy? Which ones do you struggle with the most? You, personally. Which ones would your spouse say you struggle with the most? That may be a more accurate picture. If you've got guts, guys, ask your wife. Ask your wife this afternoon, which are my top three good and which are my top three bad? Wives, would you ask your husbands to comment on that? Here, here's a good one. You could show this list to your kids, moms and dads. And ask your kids, I, I wonder how many of you are brave enough to ask your children, do you think daddy does these things? Which ones does daddy do well with? Which ones does daddy do poorly with? Are you enough of a man to do that? And maybe you would ask your children to pray for you. say, you're right, daddy sometimes gets angry, and sometimes he quarrels. 
You see, the ones that may need to be one to Jesus may be the very ones that are growing up in your house. The ones in the pagan society around you may be the ones that sleep under your roof. And those may be the very ones that you're either pushing away from the gospel or the very ones that you're drawing to the gospel with the way that you live. May we walk with Christ. So, why are we commanded to do these things? So that the world would see Jesus. So that we would fulfill our mission. So, my question on this other one is, how does seeing the reason for these commands help you? To me, it helps me. If I'm just told to be these things, that's not, you know, I can try real hard, but I go, oh, I messed it up. But if I see the reason for being these things, it helps me to be more diligent to do them because I see the purpose that God has established that we would live and love in him. Let's pray together.